Okay, here we go. Next one is um, blood clotting or hemostasis. So we've got essentially three main steps. I'll list them up here. Maybe I'll draw a blood vessel down here. So we've got the endothelial lining. I'm doing it in, in uh, longitudinal section. The vessel would be running lengthwise here. We've got our endothelial cells lining the vessel. Right, we've got our red blood cells in here. I exaggerate their size. There'd be more of them. I'm just sort of showing you where they would be. Um, we have our basement membrane. Again, the major protein of which is, or one of the proteins of which is collagen. Right? And then we have the potential for um, smooth muscle and a connective tissue. Right? If this is a capillary, we're done. But if it's a bigger vessel like an artery or a vein, we have uh, smooth muscle. Outside that, contractile smooth muscle. And then outside that, we have a connective tissue sheath, which completes the vessel wall. Okay, so if we uh, damage this vessel in some way, so like a, this might help the vessel, and one thing to point out now is that uh, the endothelium is releasing uh, several anticoagulants. The, the key one probably would be PGI2, right? Oops, not PI2, PGI2. Right, and remember that is uh, inhibiting one of the key steps of clot formation. So healthy endothelium is releasing that and other molecules. Uh, antithrombin and thrombomodulin, but again, this is a key one uh, released by the endothelium itself to inhibit abnormal um, um, clot formation, right? And remember we talked about that class, that's called thrombus formation, right? Thrombus is when we get an abnormal blood clot on the wall of a vessel. Now, let's go back to normal clotting, right? We're gonna have step one of, of hemostasis. Step one is the vascular phase. Right? And in the vascular phase, um, the smooth muscle in the wall contracts in response to tissue damage. And so we have to sort of inflict some damage here on our vessel. So I'm going to poke a hole in it. I can't just redraw the whole thing over and over again. So I'm just going to poke a hole in our vessel here. Right? We've got our, our endothelium is now, so this cell's torn, this cell's torn. Our basement membrane is now exposed. Even the um, smooth muscle is torn, right? The connective tissue is torn. And so blood is, right, blood is leaking out of this vessel. Not good, right? So we have to stem that loss. Well, uh, during the vascular phase, the tissue damage itself and chemicals that are very rapidly released by activated platelets will cause vascular spasm. In other words, just so the vascular phase is dominated by contraction of the smooth muscle. It's called vasospasm, the uh, vessel contracting. And the big mediator of that is probably TXA2. There's, there are multiple others, but that's probably the main one. Uh, again, largely from the platelets, but also from dem cells. Um, that's going to cause this vessel to sort of pinch down, uh, reducing the loss through this opening. Okay. Uh, those activated platelets are also going to release um, a molecule called ADP. Again, largely from platelets, but again, damaged tissue itself can release some of these chemicals. And that's going to lead us into phase two, um, which is the platelet phase. And in the platelet phase, we get uh, activated platelets. So I'm going to show activated platelets in blue here. Right? They're all over the place, lots of them. They're very small. And normally, they're just floating around, banging into the walls, banging into each other, and they don't stick to anything. But once they become activated by ADP, 
And again, this is a sort of a positive feedback loop here. The damaged tissue initiates some activation of these guys, and then they start to release ADP, which causes more platelet activation, which causes more ADP, which causes more platelets to stick, right? So this sort of accelerates quickly. Um, but the ADP causes the platelets to sort of change, they become activated instead of these sort of like passively circulating platelets. And the big thing that happens is their intracellular calcium goes up. Okay, whatever, right? But that's going to cause them to secrete more of these substances. But in addition, it changes their membranes such that they become sticky. And what they stick to is other platelets and uh, very specifically the collagen of the basement membrane that became exposed. So our platelets are going to start to accrue, accumulate here, where the vessel wall is broken. Right, hopefully you can see that. Um, so I've got my platelets starting to stick here to the collagen. There is a protein in the plasma that is aiding that. Remember, that's that von Willebrand factor. That's also floating around freely all the time. And it's a link, forms a link between the platelet and the collagen. But until the collagen is exposed, it's got nothing to do, right? There's nothing to link to. So only when it's, the platelets become activated, do they bind the von Willebrand factor, and then the von Willebrand factor will link them, tie them to this basement membrane. Okay, so really the platelet phase is dominated by formation of a platelet plug. Okay, sort of positive feedback loop, platelets are sticking, causing more platelets, platelets to stick. Platelet plug is formed, so I'm gonna expand this, make it bigger it sort of covers this, right? And so now at this point, you might, I mean, depending on the size of the vessel and the size of the hole here, this might stop, right? Or at least be diminished. The blood loss would be diminished. Now it's not really well stabilized at this point. So we have to go to step three. Okay, right? so let's put in our plate, put the plug formed, right? Again, von Willebrand factor, linking the platelets to the collagen, stick, 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 form a plug, right? We call that out, it's also called a white clot, right? Because it really doesn't have any red blood cells stuck in it yet. Now, in the process of doing this, there is the fibrinogen protein that's also free floating here in the plasma, right? Remember we talked about that in the blood com uh, content component video. So if that's fibrinogen, well, guess what, the fibrinogen starts to actually stick to the, they have receptors, the platelets have receptors for it that become activated. And so the fibrinogen starts to stick in the platelet plug. So now we've got these strands of um, fibrinogen stuck in the, in the plug. Well, they're not really helping to stabilize it yet because they're just little strands, right? But what we're gonna do is the platelet phase, because of its activation of some of the factors in the coagulation phase, step three, right, we have activation of these sort of key um, pro-coagulant factors that are going to lead from, uh, and, and this is a really, really complicated step, but we simplified it down to all of these factors becoming activated and finally leading to, I gotta squeeze it over here, finally leading to the activation of thrombin, right? That is the key step in coagulation, right? You had prothrombin, which is inactive and it gets activated to become this active uh, enzyme called thrombin whose job it is to polymerize fibrinogen to fibrin. And what that's doing is it's taking something small, combining them, the fibrinogens, combining them to make a big rope-like molecule called fibrin. Right? So the thrombin acts on fibrinogen, fibrinogen, sorry. fiber, right? And so remember, specifically, thrombin is the enzyme acting on fibrinogen to polymerize it, making them combine to form a polymer called fibrin, right? So these yellow strands are going to become bigger strands, 
right? Because we're going to be combining um, fibrin, uh, sorry, fibrinogen molecules. And in addition, another thing that happens is they start to link together, right? And so you actually end up with links between them, right? If I keep drawing a few of these, these links, well, it starts to look like a mesh, right? And that's exactly what forms. So the fibrin, once formed, cross-links, right, attaches to other fibrin molecules to form not long ropes, but a net. The net is embedded in the, the clot, platelet plug, and then what will become the mature clot, trapping red blood cells, white blood cells, the platelets are already in here, right? And so now we have the full-blown clot, right, the mature clot that's going to be stabilized and stay in place while this vessel heals. Okay? Uh, let's see. All right, so we have the fibrin formation. Over time, what we need to have happen, though, is as this heals, is we need to get rid of this clot. That is not part of hemostasis. That's part of what's called fibrinolysis. Fibrinolysis, I'm going to squeeze that down here. Fibrinolysis says what it is, right? Fibrin lysis. Lysis means to break, right? What are we breaking? We're breaking the fibrin. Well, that involves the slow production over time of something called TPA, tissue plasminogen activator. So TPA is slowly released by the, the, the healing um, endothelium and vessel wall in general, but largely the endothelium. And that activator will convert the inactive plasminogen into active plasmin. Again, key step in fibrinolysis. Form the enzyme that will digest the clot, right? So TPA converts, kind of like, remember how thrombin the, on the other end of things, making the clot, thrombin converted fibrinogen to fibrin? TPA converts plasminogen to plasmin, plasmin being the active enzyme that digests fibrin, chews it up, starts to degrade our clot. So the TPA, let's squeeze down in here, plasminogen, I know, sorry, it's too small, and I can't spell either. Plasminogen to plasmin, I got it down there, can you see it? Right? TPA converts plasminogen, inactive plasminogen, into active plasmin. Again, the enzyme that digests the fibrin strands. Believe it or not, this, this uh, precursor enzyme gets stuck in the clot as it formed, so it's already there and ready to be activated to start break down, breaking down the clot when the stimulus arrives. Okay? So now we've gone all the way through formation of the clot, hemostasis and then subsequent fibrinolysis, removal of the clot once healing has occurred. Just a quick mention of um, if you get um, hemostasis, I can't call it hemostasis, if you get clot formation uh, that occurs abnormally, pathologically, if it forms, if you get a clot that forms on the vessel wall because the vessel wall is damaged due to disease, in other words, we get an incomplete endothelium because of age or disease, um, then we can get activation of this pathway and a clot formation. That's a thrombus, right? Stagnant blood, blood that's not circulating quick, uh, rapidly and flowing back to the heart, usually in the veins. Uh, it can happen in the upper chambers of the heart too. Those are called the atria. Um, but that blood that's not moving real well will uh, sort of spontaneously clot and form a clot that's not on the wall. It's sort of free floating. That's called an embolus, right? A thrombus can break free off of the wall to become a free-floating clot, which is an embolus. So thrombus can lead to an embolus. The embolus is going to float free until it gets caught in a vessel that is small enough, right? That it's going to enter large vessels returning to the heart, let's say, from the legs, where we get DVTs. It's going to come back to the heart. It's going to go to the pulmonary circuit. And it's going to eventually run into a vessel, an arteriole, that's uh, too small for it to pass, and it's gonna block that vessel, and the downstream tissue is not gonna get any blood flow. 
right? That's called an infarct or an infarction, right? If it happens in the heart uh, in response to a thrombus, right, a blood clot in the coronary vessels that blocks blood flow to a region of the heart muscle, you have a um, uh, myocardial infarction, right? Myocardium being the heart muscle, infarction being the area of non-perfused, no blood flow, uh, that's going to die if we don't open up that vessel and return blood flow and the oxygen and nutrients that come with it. Okay. Um, and again, the only way to treat these clots really is to, I mean, right, the emergency treatment for these clots is to administer TPA, right? So you catheterize the person, you drip this, uh, this molecule onto the clot itself, and you'll locally convert plasminogen to plasmin and initiate digestion of that clot, removal of that abnormal clot. Okay, you can get, uh, I mentioned pulmonary embolism, you can get embolism, emboli, plural, in the systemic circuit as well. Um, usually those are from uh, emboli that form in the atria of the heart. If you think about this, that would mean they would it would form in the left atrium of the heart, right? Left atrium to left ventricle, left ventricle to the body. So those can end up in your head. They can end up anywhere, right? If they end up in your head, in your cerebral uh, uh, blood flow circuit, then you have what's called um, an ischemic stroke, right? Uh, an ischemic stroke meaning a, a, a stroke that blocks a blood vessel. Right? It calls a, a cerebral embolism too, right? Same thing. Again, they don't have to be in the pulmonary circuit. It depends on where that, that clot formed on, and in which circuit it's going to end up in, okay? Either systemic circuit, somewhere in the body, or pulmonary circuit, lungs only. Okay, anyway, more information than you need. You do need to understand the difference between a thrombus and an embolus, and then what an embolism is when it gets the embolus gets caught, and then the infarct that it uh, creates, right? Okay, I think we're good. On hemostasis, fibrinolysis, abnormal clot formation, good to go.